TitleMatchNetwork.com. Hogan in his book says that uh, him and Andre drew the house that Shea stayed in. What are your thoughts? I heard that. And I did an interview for the paper, and I'll say it again. Remember the days when you called me uh, your hero, Terry? Because you know, you, know, you know better. It's a lie. I mean, if Bruno and me were the only match that night, it would have sold out. People didn't care. I mean, you had the Japanese. The Japanese, if I remember, didn't even get paid. They just wanted to fly over and be on the card. Right. To right. be on the yeah. card for publicity for Japan. Right. You know, they had some tag magic. People, they just didn't care. And at that time, you know, that's when Hogan was going through his problems because he didn't want to be a jabroni for Andre, but that's what he was. It went third or fourth match. Andre beat him in five minutes or three minutes. That was his big Shea Stadium debut. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, <laughs> give you a spanking. <laughs> what, what was uh, Bruno's early opinions of uh, Hogan at that time? Me. <coughs> <coughs> I don't know what it... I don't know what Bruno's opinions was, you know, like if, when he first came around. And uh, it wasn't so much, you know, the Hogan's or the Warriors that, that Bruno, you know, cared about or even thought about. It was, it was the McMahons uh, because Bruno knew that, you know, it wasn't Hogan doing this or, you know, this guy doing that. It was they were doing what McMahon was telling them to do. Especially at that time, you know, down the road, they became big stars, things change. But back in the early 80s, you know, but so, you know, to Bruno and some other old school guys, the things they were doing to the business, you know, they felt weren't good for the business. And it really wasn't in the long run. It, it, it took off for a couple of years because it was novel. And then Vince got on NBC, which made it uh, you know, very big and, and novel. And for the first time, it it became cool to watch wrestling instead of being a, a wrestling fan. And, but that novelty wore off quick, and he, he had a few guys that you know, made household names of themselves. But then for years, it became very, very hard for everybody else because the drama was gone. The, the mystique was gone. And then we basically had to start over. You know what? I wasn't too nervous at Shea. I was, I was cool with Shea. I, I, I got over the... The nervous stuff real early, as soon as we did the thing on TV where I hit him with the chair, as soon as that TV show, like the, that Saturday, I, I, I went to some show and man, it was night and day. I mean, people you know, would love me before, huh. but nah, they wanted to kill me. And I don't mean hate me, I mean they wanted to kill me. Uh, you, can't, you can't do that today to an audience, it's not like it was. But, uh, you know, I was kind of, but it, it, it was such an exhilarating, because not only was it exhilarating from just walking out and the people really just going berserk, everybody in the business, the boys, you know, all the, the secondary promoters, everybody but the McMahons, right. changed to me. You know, it was like, oh, God, Larry's here. You know, it wasn't like, I mean, and, and, and we did... You know, like two or three you know, shows in Madison Square Garden, and we did we did shows in all the big arenas, Boston and Phillies, and those days you could do that. So by the time we got to Shea Stadium, I was already cocky. Right. I mean, I was. Uh, in, in, in fact, Bruno wasn't sure. McMahon thought it would bomb. I told him, I said, "We will draw. We will sell out this son of a bitch because I can feel it." Right. Bruno wasn't at all the shows. McMahon was at the racetrack. I was the one that was out in all the shows, and I said, there's no way. He said, so you didn't believe in it all that much. And Bruno, you know, thought it would do good, but never thought they'd sell out Shea Stadium in those days. Right. They, well, they wouldn't sell it out today. Whose idea was it to put you with Bruno as his mentor? Well, it really wasn't no one's idea. It just kind of happened. I mean, I, like I said, I, bumped, I walked into the yard, I right. introduced myself, started working out together. And he promised, uh, you know, if I finished college, he'd start me in the business. So I finished college, and, and uh, he started me, uh, you know, in the business. And it was Bruno's idea to do the, you know, protege thing. What was uh, Bruno like to deal with in those days? Well, he was great. He was, he was a great guy. He, he was, uh, you know, I mean, like he gave me a break when, in, in times when it wasn't, you know, heard of. He, he was also a guy because because in those days there was no contracts. There was a verbal agreement by promoters. If you were a top guy, you do good. If you were were not a top guy, uh, you never knew what was going to happen. 
And Bruno was a guy who would not only help me out, but he stuck up for a lot of guys because of guys you know, would come to Bruno and say, oh my God, Bruno, I can hardly feed my family. I did this big show, you know, Vince gave me a hundred dollars. You know, Bruno, would, but they, they wouldn't go to McMahon because they were afraid because Vince would, you know, fire them. Right, right. And then in those days, even though there was different territories, you had to be careful because, you know, McMahon was working with the Crockett's who were working with these guys who, you know, so if you really ticked off the, you know, the, the old man, he'd call someone and the promos would black boy, so no one would use you. Right. And there was a lot of weird politics like that. But Bruno would be the guy that would, you know, go up and say, hey, come on, how did this guy drive there? And you give him a hundred bucks on a big show. And, you know, but Bruno was the guy who would stick up for, for stuff. Actually, Bruno ran. That's a different story. But he basically ran the whole machine of the WWF for years. And that's kind of how, how it kind of led to the, the way Junior is today and some things. Whose idea was it for the uh, turn for you and uh, Bruno? Well, that was my idea. I was um, I was getting kind of point in my career with, where you're talking about seven, eight years has gone by, six, seven, eight years, something like that. And I was well known as Bruno's protege. And but but Bruno retired. Bruno was doing the broadcasting. Broke his neck earlier. He was sick of getting hurt. He, he just was done. Right. But in the meantime, that's another part of a long story. The WWWF is not doing good. Bob Backlund was the champion. Nobody cared. And that was the beginning of the McMahons doing what they want instead of what the fans want. And they paid the price. The WWWF was almost bankrupt. So... I'm sitting there watching this, and I'm thinking to myself, the business is so down. But but it was down because the fans at that time, they didn't want Bruno to retire. You couldn't follow Bruno with anybody, let alone Howdy Doody. <laughs> but so I, I went to Bruno, and I said, I said look, I said, if, 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 you know, if you make a special comeback, here's my idea. I knew it would be big. I knew right. it would be huge because everybody, I didn't want Bruno to retire. <laughs> And I figured if I didn't do it because the McMahon's ain't drawn, that they're going to be begging, and before I know it, it'll be Bruno and somebody. So I went to Bruno, and I had this kind of idea about, you know, I'd like to, you know, do something. Otherwise, I'm kind of like stagnant here. This would be a big shot for me. And and then uh, he, he thought about it and agreed, and then, then, then he took over. And then off and went. Is there any truth to the fact that the heat with you and Bruno stems from Bruno feeling you pressured him into the program at all or no? No. Okay. <laughs> you like? couldn't pressure Bruno into doing anything. He right. was the guy. What was it like to work with Bruno? Oh, it was heaven. It was you guys. You know, I mean, I, I, I guess for anybody, it, it would be like being with the biggest and the best. Who was the biggest movie star today? I mean, I don't know the big. I mean, like, like the Pirates of the Caribbean. Right. I mean, they look like, like if I said to somebody, hey, I want to be a, uh, I want to go do a movie. And they say, well, hey, work with Johnny Depp and be a pirate of the Caribbean. They would be like, you right. can't get any, right. any bigger. So, I mean, for me to get in the ring and you know, do that with Bruno, to me, it was, you know, a, the dream come true. But I was already getting a little bit mature. And, and I could see how it, it, it made my name in the business. I rode the me and Bruno thing for 20 years. Plus, now that I'm still around on TV, I kind of help keep the Bruno thing alive. Definitely. Well, it was kind of a, it was kind of a destiny thing. It was uh, you know Bruno became my hero, and uh, big big fan. And then w one day I went to church. My family drags us all off to church, and I'm sitting there in the pew, and I look over down the pew, and who's a few people down there? That's my dad, and my mom, and. And there's Bruno sitting in the pew at church. So everybody went up and, and went to, uh, not confession, the other one, communion. And I didn't go. I sat there because I wanted to slide down <laughs> and sit next <laughs> to Bruno. So I remember the rest of the Mass, I'm sitting there right next to Bruno, you know, and I was like in, in heaven. I'm looking at him and, I'm and his wrist, I mean, I was looking like I'm sitting next to, you know, Godzilla there. I'm in awe. So, uh, Afterwards, the service lets out, and down I go, and I'm waiting outside the steps, and here comes Bruno. 
So I hit him up for an autograph, and I still have this at home. I might put a picture of it in my book. But it's, it's got the old uh, St. Anne's or St. Sebastian's like Sunday bulletin with the date on it, <laughs> with Bruno's signature, you know, Teleri on it. And as he was running, as he was, you know, signed it and was trying to, you know, run away, and I remember yelling really loud because we laughed about it years later. He was, I was, I was, I was yelling in front of all the church people, good luck against the beast! <laughs> so he was wrestling at the time, and he cringed and just, right. Kept on going, but then it was just weird. You know, some years after that, my mom worked. You know, wound up working at that same little school. So uh, that that's where David went to school. Bruno's kid, and I found out through my mother where Bruno lived. Huh. And uh, basically, uh, it's another part of a long story. But after I found out where Bruno lived, I that's a whole other story there. All right, you can go into it if you want, but. Uh, well, man, to make a long story short, I, I basically, you know, got a little older, got 16, started driving the car, and every time I went somewhere, I drove past Bruno's house. So you're stalking him. I was a stalker. Right. <laughs> so one day in his backyard, I look at, you know, through the hedges, and who I see sitting in the backyard is Bruno. He's playing with, playing with David, who was a little kid at that time. So I, I parked the car, and I come crawling through his hedges, and I'm coming through his hedges, and he <laughs> He looks at me and he gets up and I'm like, wow, and I just introduced myself. And for some reason, like again, it just must have been, you know, meant to be, uh, uh, I was very respectful and we hit it off. And, and uh, for, for months after that, every, every time I saw him in his backyard, I'd stop in and say hi, it got to become a thing. Right. And then uh, I got a little older, we started working out together. But basically, he was the only guy I met in the business. Oh, wow. And he lived you know, a couple of miles down the street from me, and that's how I had access to him, because I get busted into his yard. Huh. But but he was the man at the time who was the only man to know. Back then, uh, there wasn't wrestling schools. They didn't want you in the business. And Bruno was such a star that it was the politics. When Bruno you know, brought me in, everyone was nice to me. You know, the Strongbows, the Monsoons, even the McMahons. Sometimes and you know the Savoldis and the, you know, everybody but because because being nice to me was showing respect for Bruno so it right. really kind of you know helped my career immensely it was just you know the politics of it. What was the training like for you as far as like how you got in the business? You told Bruno you wanted to be a wrestler and he pretty much took you under his wing. Well, he took me under his wing and actually uh, training with Bruno wasn't so much wrestling. It was a couple of things. Bruno wasn't much of a wrestler wrestler. He wasn't like Carl Gotch. But but he was just so damn strong. And he knew some simple things, you know, front face locks and arm locks and wrist locks and some arm bars. Uh, but what I did with Bruno, with Bruno was a fanatic on, on training. And we'd go down to his basement. He had a little gym set up in his basement. And I mean a little gym. I mean, he just had a bench with a big Olympic bar and a bunch of weights and one incline huh. bench. And that was it, you know, in one little room in his basement. And we'd work out there for about three hours every other day. And I, I basically did the same workout he did, which was like an hour and a half just on chest. And, you know, Bruno's, I mean, he was, his chest was massive and he had that look. And I kind of developed kind of a similar look to Bruno because I did the same workout. So right. the protege thing kind of clicked right in. But I remember we were doing an hour and a half just on chest. We start off with benches, you know, maybe a few reps real light, and then gradually increase and gradually you know, decrease the number of reps. And uh, it was about maybe, you know, a good couple years in his basement of me and him working out together when I was still finishing up, you know, school and, and wrestling amateur. But I went um, basically from, you know, nothing to in two years after working out with Bruno, I was benching 465 and a half pounds. Wow. Was my best bench. And at that time, I weighed 235. And years before the steroids and all that stuff came out. I mean, and Bruno at this time, you know, I was maybe 20, 21-ish. And Bruno was already maybe around 40-ish. And uh, the most I ever did was 465. Bruno was still doing 505 at that time. Mm -hmm. And then after we did our maximum, we had a contest. He was big on contests. 
So we had a contest who could do the most reps. We put 350 pounds on the bar. And we had a contest. I did it 19 reps. Huh. And he did it like 22. Huh. Yeah, it was, uh, but with that, you know, Bruno was a lot of, of, of physical training in that. Uh, the, the wrestling background, I had more wrestling than 99% of the guys anyway, just from all the high school and the college stuff. I, I kind of worked out wrestling-wise at Guido's Barn, but not with Guido, with Bill Eady. Me and Bill Eady used to go down to Guido's Barn and work out a lot together right when we were starting. Right. Which is kind of another weird story, because after me and Bill started, I didn't see Bill for 30 years. He was always <laughs> in one place, right? and I was always in another place. Weren't they the Mongols? Or the one was well, Guido was a Mongo with Beppo, who was what uh, Volkov for years. And I think Bill was a Mongo for a little bit. Right. Then he was ten other things. <laughs> yeah. It seems that Bruno booked you a lot in the Pittsburgh area. Did like other wrestlers have like different parts of the Northeast, and how did you get uh, jobs in other parts of the territory? Like, who was a fan of your kind like, of a two part question. <laughs> Well, was, there wasn't different parts. Uh, Pittsburgh was Bruno's territory right. when I started. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it was right after I started, he sold it to Guido the Mongol. And I think Guido sold it to Pedro Martinez. But that was right after that, I think McMahon you know, bought him out. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, God, I can't remember the year. But you're talking early, maybe like 72, 72 73. 72, 73, even 74, 75. It was already Pittsburgh was already part of the WWWF, probably the farthest part west. It went from like you know, Bangor, Maine to Pittsburgh and south like to Baltimore, Washington, and that was it. Because I think your first, uh, looking back, uh, the first outside Pittsburgh, you wrestled in uh, Philly on uh, March 9th of 74 against Johnny Rods. Remember that? No. No? Okay. <laughs> I remember Johnny Rods. But uh, you know, we got that, that. You wrestled every every day back yeah. then. It wasn't like today where you fly out on Saturdays or whatever these guys do now. But it, it was just uh, it was just an everyday thing. But 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 that uh, that you know, early seventies, even after I started, I remember doing very briefly with the Bruno thing when I started. But, but it was it was the you know that that that, that was a territory that yeah. whole area. <laughs> so if you worked there, you worked for the McMahons, and if you know you weren't, then. You worked for some other promoter. Right. It seems like 72, 73, you were starting out here and there, but 74 was like your big year where you got booked everywhere. Well, it's 70, 70, 70, 70, 70. So then if 74 you won Rookie of the Year. Well, I, yeah. When I started, I was still finishing up school. But when I started in the little... Because they said like April 1st was your first garden show. It could be. Against Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan? Yeah, Eddie Sullivan. Wow. I, mean, I don't remember an Ed Sullivan. I don't remember the first match. And the second one you wrestled, uh, Jose Gonzalez, the invader, the guy who killed Brody. Okay, remember yeah, that? I wrestled Jose a lot. Mm -hmm. He was Monsoon's guy. Right. But uh, I don't remember too much of the first guys. I remember the first Pittsburgh Civic Arena show yeah. with Slip Mahoney Dorso. I don't remember yeah, it. Frank Dorso. Dorso. Yeah. Frank Dorso. He was a classic. <laughs> what are your titlematchnetwork.com